Hey there, curiosity connoisseurs. Are you intrigued by all things strange, weird, and unusual, but too embarrassed to talk with your friends and family about it? Well, we're your family now. Join me, chronically curious Katie. And me, combat veteran Chris, as we don our tinfoil hats and question everything. From crazy mysteries, out of this world conspiracies, and the unbelievable happenings all around us. Let's try to stay sane as we laugh and explore together through our podcast, Stop Thinking With Your Butt. Wherever you like to listen. Hey everybody, welcome to Films and Fermentation, episode 103. This is our fifth season finale. That's right, we are Films and Fermentation, a movie and alcohol podcast. I'm Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. We're just three friends who like to talk shit about movies while getting shit-faced. On this episode, we bring our fifth season to a close with a very special topic. Uh, we did a Getting to Know Us episode, uh, I think it was... about you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think it was season two, the first time we did the Getting to Know Us episode, and we talked so. a lot about like the movies we like growing up and all that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we decided to go back to that for our season finale, but we're doing a different topic tonight, one that I came up with and then couldn't answer myself for like six days. <laughs> It was, uh, the question is, if you wanted someone to know more about your personality or taste in film, what five movies would you screen for them? This topic is definitely a sinker. It really took me a while. I think it was actually like this morning when I finished my list. Because, you know, I struggled with the question that I came up with. I have the fifth one like five minutes before we started. (laughs) All right. uh, (laughs) At least it was not, at least it wasn't just me. Uh, don't forget to drop us an email at filmsandfermentation at gmail.com or visit linktree.com slash filmsandfermentation to find all of our social media podcast links. You can uh, support the show at Patreon. You can buy our merchandise at teespring.com at the Films and Fermentation merchandise store. Uh, we are on all major podcast platforms. You can find us everywhere. Uh, we recently switched hosting platforms to Buzzsprout. Let me tell you a little bit about Buzzsprout. Podcasting isn't difficult when you have the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. If you want to upgrade, Buzzsprout is the right platform for you. Give them a visit at buzzsprout.com and make sure you let them know that Films and Fermentation sent you. Gentlemen, what are we drinking this evening? Kev, I kind of want to go with you because I'm interested in your uh, your your, my, your uh, walk of life. I, my <laughs> walk of life. So I have three. You guys know I've been upping my game lately. Um, and I yeah. wanted to, you know, pick three beers that have had significance over hobby, my life. So you up your game right. when it's a healthy hobby. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> three beers that have had a significant impact on my life. Probably the first beer uh, I remember drinking. Is mm-hmm. a traditional Yingling lager, you know, from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. We had this in the house. It was between this and Rolling Rock, uh, both of which my father drinks. And um, by just, you know, genetics, I, I <laughs> tend to drink it too. Uh, then there was a time in my life when I had to, to ditch the higher calorie beers and go for something a little lighter. Now, you may recall back in the early 2000s when I had a big old scare about how heavy I was and I started to lose weight, actively try to lose weight. This is what I resorted to. (laughs) I had to resort to this, to drinking Michelob Ultra, Uh, but it helped. I will say drinking that uh, kept me a little more sober, kept a lot of weight off, you know, Um, between that and working out and eating right. um, I did. I lost a tremendous amount of weight in a period of time that scared people. (laughs) <laughs> and I got it all back. I lost it, but I found it, you know. Uh, and that's when I decided I need to enjoy life and enjoy beer and explore the craft breweries around. But also sticking with Pennsylvania, I went to Victory and found this beloved thing, which is the Golden Monkey, uh, which is a Belgian style triple ale. It's nine and a half percent alcohol by volume. And if you haven't eaten anything for the day and had two or three of these, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, it depends on your your perspective of a good thing there, Michael. You know, you don't feel pain anymore 
You don't be like Leo going onto a podcast without eating and start drinking again. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, you but they made for an awesome podcast. Colors. Oh, that reminds yes. me. Michael, why don't you talk about your drinks? I'm going to add something to this week in film history. All right. So I'm going to get, I am drinking a beer that my good friend Kevin gave me. Mm. It's uh, from Upward Brewing Company from the Catskill Mountains of New York. It's Base Camp Lager Beer, 5.7% alcohol by volume. Have you started, Mike? Is it any I good? I have. What's it's good. Think? It's got a little of a, a backbite mm. to it. But a little bit. I think Base Camp was my favorite up there, which is why I picked up uh, a four pack of that. I am also drinking a Kevin beer tonight, one from the Cat Skills as well from uh, West Kill Brewing. It's called the Sap House. And it is a maple brown ale brewed with foraged maple bark and maple syrup from the Catskill Mountains. Uh, it is 5.8% alcohol by volume. And my wife in the background just said, ew. <laughs> thick as motor oil. It's actually really good. It's not that thick. It's an ale, so it's a little thinner. Mm -hmm. It's got a little bit of thickness to it because of the maple, but it's not, right. it's not an overpowering maple flavor. It tastes uh, more like... I would say a cross between like a lager and a porter. Okay. That's pretty good. Good. I'm glad you guys like that. Two thumbs up. If I wanted to do my beer trail, like I was saying in the pre show, it would have been Heineken was the first one I ever got as a kid because that's what mm -hmm. I could get when I was, you know, underage. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Killian's Red was one of my favorites growing up. I used to drink Yingling all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the first craft beer quote unquote I ever had was Sam Adams Oktoberfest. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's that's probably the one that got me like on the trail to trying more of like and that was when stuff. Sam Adams was still a small company. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, they had their Sam Adams um was it Sam Adams lager, mm -hmm. but I mean they were just tapping into like doing this the seasonal stuff and the craft stuff. You know, I think the Oktoberfest is probably the one to kind of put them on the on the map a little mm. bit. That's mm -hmm. that's the first one I ever had from Sam Adams. So. Well, if you're going to go with the way you know what we started with, I would have to go with Pap's Blue Ribbon. <laughs> that was in the house, in a bag, a little brown bag. No, it wasn't in a brown bag. It was a six pack in the house. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, the brown bag was for your Cole Forty Five when you played Edward Forty Hands. <laughs> <laughs> when you try to be, you know, smooth. Now, Michael, oh, were you drinking Pabst in America, or were you already in Germany at this point? No, this was this was in America. <laughs> um, and then in Germany, I started drinking. You know, besides the German beers, mm -hmm. um, I drank more MGD, Miller Genuine Grass. Really? Yeah. Mm, okay. And then the, those like a, a typical American beers are kind of popular in Europe. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I have to say the next uh, one I would go with would be the uh, the longboard. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Kona. I really like Kona? longboard. Yeah, longboard. Yeah, Kona's good. That's yeah. probably one of my favorite of the uh, non-traditional beers. Mm. I know they're themed. They have a tropical or Hawaiian theme. Are they brewed in Hawaii? Yes. W would that technically be considered an import? Uh, not it's really. Not, I don't think it's considered an import because it's an American because it's a state. It's an American beer. Yeah. Still, okay. still considered an American beer. I'm sure you pay a little extra though for the shipping because it's yeah. <laughs> yeah coming from an island. But yeah, I like Kona. I like the longboard, and I like the um. I think it's the golden ale or something like that they have. Uh, like big a wave. Lighter the big one. Wave. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one too. And I like Victory Brewing, Kev, but I am not a fan of the gold monkey one. I know. Not many <laughs> are. But I, I will tell you, I went to the brewery, liked a few of their beers. That was probably the first time I bought a growler of mm. something. I really liked it a lot. And um, I was like, well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't buying bottled craft beer at the time really i was going to breweries to have them mm -hmm. i didn't know if they were selling them in stores so i got myself a, a growler a 64 ounce growler and held on to that for a while um it's, i don't you know that's there's a few i like of victory this is just one of them you know i don't i'm not a big fan of the dire were dire wolf or um i 
can't think of the other one. Hops Devil, not mm-hmm. a huge fan, but I do like the Golden Monkey. God, which beer is known as the Champagne of Beers? Is that MGD? It is not MGD. It's it's Michelob Ultra. Michelob no, Ultra? That's no. not the Champagne of Beers. No, no. It's, it's um, uh, I thought it was um, Miller High Life. It, was, it, it might Miller be Miller High, High Life. Life. Is it Miller, it's High, Miller, Miller High, Life. High Life? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's Miller, Miller time. <laughs> yeah, it is a Miller. It is a Miller, but it wasn't. It's not MGD, but it's right. a Miller it's High Life. Champagne uh, of Beers. Mike, anything interesting <laughs> happen this week in film history? This day in film history. In 1927, actress Mae West found guilty of obscene and corrupting the morals of youth in a New York stage play entitled Sex. She is sentenced <laughs> 10 days in prison and fined $500. The resulting publicity launches her Hollywood career, which hmm. tells me sex sells. Yeah, sex exactly. Sells. <laughs> Mae West. I'm trying to think what I know her for. Um, I know she was in a movie called She Done Him Wrong. There's a pretty popular song that came from that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'm no angel. I mean, yeah, she she understood that sex sells because she, she she didn't let that stop her. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at her IMDb here. She was on the Mr. Red show for a while. Uh, Who did she play? Mrs. One Ed? episode. She was one episode on Mr. Red as herself. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's pretty funny. What's your next one you got there? 1934, Shirley Temple <laughs> appeared in her first. I'm oh, sorry. That's a complete film. 180 to go from Mae West and the play Sex to start talking about <laughs> Shirley Temple. <laughs> sorry, they both happened the same day, just, yeah. you know, seven years apart. <laughs> uh, 1937, Shirley Temple appears in her first film, feature length film, Stand Up and Cheer. Hollywood was like, we got to save everybody from Mae West, so let's start making movies starring this <laughs> with, little girl with, that's, that's yeah. named after a non-alcoholic beverage. <laughs> ah, sorry. And then a year later, in 1935, <laughs> The Bride of Frankenstein, horror film classic and sequel to Frankenstein starring Boris Koloff and Elsa Lancaster is released. Yes. <laughs> the iconic Bride of Frankenstein with the big hairdo. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, she's, only, she's, 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 in, like, she's only in like the thousand corpses. <laughs> yeah, she's only in like the last four minutes of the film, The Bride of Frankenstein. And then yes, I added the last one because I just found this out today. It's the twentieth anniversary of House of a Thousand Corpses. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Rob Zombie is releasing a uh, like director's master cut on Blu-ray and and uh, and Steelbook. Oh Jesus! <laughs> and in honor of it, so. Jason, Kathy, if you're listening and you want to get us a Christmas present next year. Don't get me that. <laughs> do not. Please do not. <laughs> I'm kind of Real surprised take- it's, not the, it's not the premiere date of uh, Dazed and Confused or uh, Half-Baked or, uh, um, you know, I'm Fast sure it's probably or Rich, Rich High. I'm sure it's probably one of those two, but it's the, it's the first thing I noticed in my Twitter feed today, so I had to add it. Uh, <laughs> For those of you listening, we're recording on on April twentieth. Yes, we are recording on mm-hmm. April twentieth for uh, release on April twenty fourth. Right. So, what is uh, party, baby? Yeah. What is your uh, must try beer craft destination? Where's Mike? Oh, I have a must try beer. From it's a it's called that's all, folks. That's exactly what it is. It's twelve sixty five Pilsner from Left Hand Brewing Company, Longmont. Colorado. Left hand takes a slightly non-traditional route with this pale gold, slightly hazy light lager named for the brewing company's address at 1265 Boston Avenue. All the bready Pilsner malt sweetness is as one would expect, but the hops are more in keeping with a domestic aroma varieties with lemon peel and hints of orange and pine. Thanks to the sterling citra and cascading varieties. Laced work down the glass is a white and white and textured. The pa- the palate is medium dry and finishes with a crisp enough to make the two point five of oh, no, five point two alcohol 
my volume beer palette palatable there you go i'm not having a good i'm not having a good week guys <laughs> i just realized this this is 420 instead of instead bless you instead of our uh our final episode of the season being this thoughtful retrospective getting to know us question that was very hard to think of answers for we should have just did the best movies about weed <laughs> <laughs> you mean we're gonna talk about clerks again we could have talked about basically. No, about, no, uh, we would. I would have brought up Howard, uh, Harold, and Kumar. I would have been like a forty-minute episode about Pineapple Express. <laughs> or no, uh, we could do Cheech and Chong up in smoke. Cheech and Chong <laughs> up in smoke. Talk about uh, Jay and Silent Bob and Dog. We're trying to find the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, she my cousin and I'm gonna knock on boots tonight. All right, it's time for it's that time. You know what my favorite time of the show is? Synopsis according to Glip. Oh. <laughs> this is our Synopsis According to Glip, brought to you by Newsly. Newsly is an all-in-one audio super app for iOS and Android that will read the news to you in a natural human voice. Go to Newsly.me to find out more and use the promo code ADDENFORMET to get one month premium subscription for free. Stop, start scrolling, stop listening, or I'm sorry, stop listening, stop scrolling, start listening. Newsly. <laughs> We'll Please don't stop in. listening. Please we'll do not in. stop listening. <laughs> we'll edit that in post. All right. So, uh, Glip, of course, gives us a synopsis of our previous episode. Last week's episode was our. Um, <laughs> what was last week's episode? <laughs> last week's episode. Day in the life. Was, uh, it was the day in the life. Was the day uh, life. one day movies. Day movies that take place in one day. And I, I love just, how it always just, picks up shit from Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I actually, uh, there's more to it than what you see here, gentlemen. I hit a little bit of it. Oh boy. The meeting focused on New Jersey certificates, cheeky humor of the movie, talking jive, the original ending of the film, the actresses playing June Cleaver, dimes off the back of trucks, and a flavorful kick in the nuts. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I saw Kevin... Uh, Sneaking a peek at my uh, I sneaked a peek. Sneaking a peek at my words there, but yeah, that's what it says. It says, "Whoop, that was the wrong thing." So yeah, I was hiding the dimes off of trucks and the kicking the nuts. So it well was done, um, very clever. <laughs> once again, the synopsis according to Glip doesn't fail. The meeting, uh, the New Jersey certificate thing was uh, pre-show. We were talking about your uh, your like yeah, uh, my, new, your my teaching exams. certificates. Uh, I don't know what cheeky humor of the movie is. I think I might have said something was like tongue-in-cheek humor or something at some point, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Talking Jive was, of course... Uh, that was the Airplane. Film. That was the Airplane. The original ending of the film was Clerks. Because mm -hmm. um, we talked about how the, there was an alternate ending. June Cleaver, of course, is also Airplane. She was the one talking Jive. Yeah, I, but I would like to see which actresses could play June Cleaver. I know, like, because we... It's, it's, According to Glyph, it's actresses playing June Cleaver. <laughs> yes. Dimes off the back of trucks. I said I was going to make my beer bread out of the uh, Irish stout beer, mm -hmm. and Kevin said I would purchase that with a bunch of dimes off the back of a truck. <laughs> which is, of course, he, the, he, probably, uh, he probably used his own dimes this time after tasting it. Though. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the last one was me. I took a sip of the Irish stout beer and went, wow, that's a flavorful kick in the nuts, and I picked that up. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think those two last things should be names of beers. Yeah, times off the back of trucks and the flavorful and kicking flavorful, nuts. We'll add that. We'll add that to the nuts. Quaker Rage lineup. Quaker Rage, yeah. So we have Quaker Rage, flavorful kicking the nuts. <laughs> times off the back of trucks. Times off the back of trucks. Times off the back of trucks. Beer, <laughs> beer, be beer, bread, and pig rectums. <laughs> Inverted pig rectums. Inverted pig rectums. <laughs> So uh, oh, last week, oh, it's inverted <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's the synopsis according to Glip. So last week, I posted two questions on Twitter. One was the hypothetical that we answered on the show last week. The hypothetical question was: If you could see any movie, uh, if you could go back in time and see any movie when it premiered, what movie would you like to see? Um, and I think uh, Kevin said The Matrix. I said Jaws, and mm -hmm. Mike said Wizard of Oz among some other ones that we talked about. But we have Adam at Dice Show Two Swords on Twitter who said he would like to see Wait Until Dark because legend has it people ran from the theater in terror. 
Now, if he's talking about the movie I think he's talking about, he's talking about the 1967 film starring Audrey Hepburn, uh, where she Which plays. Which is a very a, good movie, but it I is a very good. It was movie. run out of the theater, kind of scary. I mean, maybe in 1967. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, I could see The Exorcist being that scary, but yeah, because I mean, wait, wait until dark was a it was an atmospheric film about a right. blind it was girl being a thriller, but yeah, being harassed by some some guys in her apartment. Um, I read something uh, about this earlier. I thought it was funny. Alan Arkin plays one of the criminals uh, in the yeah. apartment. And he had just come off a couple of Oscar nominations for some previous films. And then he had uh, rave reviews for his performance in this movie, but didn't get an Oscar nom. And when a couple of journalists asked him, uh, how do you feel about not getting nominated for this film? His response was, you don't make a movie where you're really mean to Audrey Hepburn and expect to get nominated for it. <laughs> 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 so that's an excellent response. That is a very good movie. I remember my mom saying, you got to watch this, and we watched it together, and it was. It was an excellent suspense movie, you know? I tried looking up to see if there were other Wait After Dark films, because I'm like, mm -hmm. maybe it's like a vampire film or something like that, mm -hmm. but no, that's the only one I could really come across. <laughs> uh, Paranormal, the new Normal podcast, said he would like to see Return of the Jedi when that premiered. Mm. Um, I'll make him jealous by saying that uh, I did see Return of the Jedi when it premiered. It's the first yes, so Star I. Wars film I saw in movies, in the movies, uh, you know, before the re-releases. Uh, two dudes with Sport News podcasts said Spaceballs. Um, that started a Twitter battle between two dudes with Sports News and Power and Normal, the new normal, who called Spaceballs <laughs> trash. And then uh, two dudes came back uh, with him like, no, it's clear. And then it just kept going back and forth, back and forth. Wow. And then uh, it finally ended when Fan in the Van podcast uh, decided to go with Goodfellas. <laughs> <laughs> Which I agree. That's one. I love Goodfellas. It's one of my all-time yeah. favorite movies. I would love to have seen that in the theater. And this is funny because that's at a time where I was going to the movies a lot. Because it was like I went to see Jurassic Park, and I saw Adam's mm -hmm. Family in the movies, and I saw you know I saw all these different movies that came out in the nineties. Uh, the other question I asked on Twitter last week was, uh, "What is your favorite one day film?" After listening to our list, and uh, I got a few responses. Space Castle Pod, who of course uh, designed our show logo, said that their favorite one day film is Groundhog's Day. Yeah. Excellent one. Uh, excellent one. Uh, 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 Ken at the Mr. Gentleman podcast said Friday is his favorite one day film. Where's mm -hmm. my five dollars? Yeah. <laughs> and then Mr. Big at the Milwaukee Mob on Twitter said The Long Good Friday, which I was not familiar with. I actually had never seen this movie before or okay. like heard of it. So I looked it up and I have to put it on a list of movies I need to see. It came out in 1980. It stars uh, Bob Hoskins, mm -hmm. Helen Mirren, and a very, very young Pierce Brosnan. And it's about Are we a, talking Remington Steel kind of young? Pierce I mean, Brosnan? this is 1980, so this is probably pre-Remington Steel. Whoa. It's a very young Pierce Brosnan. And it's about an up-and-coming gangster being tested by an insurgency of, un, of an unknown powerful threat in his town. So basically, Bob Hoskins is a uh, a mobster in England, and he's about to close a deal with the American mob that's going to make him a lot of money. But then over the course of this day, as he's trying to close this deal, all this shit starts happening around town. Like his pub that he runs gets bombed, and then one of the one of his places gets robbed, and then this, something else happens. And basically, all this shit's happening in the background, and he's trying to find out what it is. Uh, and it seemed pretty cool. So hmm. I'm like, I, I have to put this on my list of movies to check out now. The Long, the long Good Friday. Long so good thank Friday. you, uh, thank you, Mr. Big at the Milwaukee Mob for giving me one to add to my list. There's and another I, one I thought of, but I didn't, I, I wouldn't quite know whether or not it's, uh, it's a great movie. It's not a great 24, uh, oh, what am I doing here? A 24 hour movie. It also had Bill Murray. He's a a uh, bank robber, him and uh, Gina that, Davis, um, quick change and... or something like that. Yeah, I think that might. Yeah, that might be quick change. That up. That was also a one day one, which I, I remember enjoying at the time. It was a funny. You I, know... I, uh, yeah, yeah. I kind of like. I vaguely remember that because I remember he was in the movie with Gina Davis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nineteen ninety. So quick change. That's right. Well, it's a short movie, man. An hour and twenty nine minutes. <laughs> 
So Bill, 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 Bill Murray, Gina yeah. Davis, Randy Quaid. Yeah. I tell you what I remember about this film. And it's funny because it's really <laughs> nothing about the film itself. Is Bill Murray and Gina Davis both went on the Arsenio Hall show to promote this movie. Mm hmm. And he spent the majority of the interview being like inappropriately touchy with Gina Davis. Bill oh, Murray. Really? <laughs> That's all I remember about it. It was just that. Like her trying to answer <laughs> questions while being like awkwardly put off by Bill Murray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I haven't seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. That's back before Randy Quaid lost his fucking mind. <laughs> <laughs> Claiming that people in Hollywood were trying to assassinate him. Well, I mean, to be fair, no one's proven that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. He moved to Canada to get away from him. That's right. We'll uh, never paranoia. find me up here. <laughs> it's not paranoia if, it, if it's true. <laughs> so uh, I got a shout out to Scott Harris at BSTV 24-7 Podcast, a podcast where he talks about everything and anything. So come along for the ride. I'm giving him a shout out because he sent us a link to his latest episode, uh, which came out yesterday or earlier this week, I'm sorry, which is titled Alcohol and Movies. He talks about finding his drink for the summer, sharing alcohol. Do people still go to the movies, or do you go to the movies for a particular actor or for the title, and so much more. I just thought it was nice that he thought of us, because the movie, his episode is all about alcohol and movies, <laughs> a uh, subject close to our hearts. <laughs> really? The BSTV 24-7 podcast. We're going to take a quick break for these short messages, and we'll be back with our main segment. Hello, Spooklings. I'm Jason. And I'm Kathy. And we're the hosts of the weekly podcast, All Hallows' Eve Podcast. We are a husband and wife duo with a passion for anything spooky, macabre, and true crime, sprinkled with our own twist of comedy. We explore topics such as the history of Halloween, the butcher of Plainfield, Hocus Pocus 2, urban legends, superstitions, and more. So come join us as we go down the rabbit hole that is All Hallows Eve Podcast. Listen and follow us at allhallowsevepodcast.com or your favorite podcast provider. Stay spooky, my friends. Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Deb. And we host a pretty fun podcast called Today We Laughed and Learned. You know, this is where we discuss all the things we should have learned, but, well, never did. And we have quite a few laughs along the way. Today we laughed and learned with Chris and Deb. We're curious about everything. Experts on nothing. Come find us wherever you get your podcasts. It's a heavy beer. I can't drink it that fast anyway. <laughs> all right. We are back with our main segment here. The Day in the Life. Oh, look at that. I forgot to change the title from last week. You Let's did. cut that part out. <laughs> Rewind. We are back after our short break with our main segment. Tonight we're doing Getting to Know Us Part 2. And we decided for this to ask a very poignant question that's movie related. If you wanted someone to know more about your personality or taste in film, what five movies would you screen for them so they would get to know you better? And I decided that we would do our list separately so we could surprise each other. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about why we chose those movies, and maybe we'll try to guess why you chose that movie and uh, see if we can guess what that has to do with your personality. Mm -hmm. And then my wife, Katie, gave me five answers as well, so we'll talk about my wife's five films. So nice. uh, who would like to go first? I'll go first. All right, Michael. So give us. Uh, so we'll do all five yeah. films and then go to the next person. So. A product of late twentieth century genetic engineering. Ooh, Wrath of Khan. Wrath of Khan. Mm, okay, yeah, yeah. I knew that was Chekhov. I was trying to figure out which uh, Star Trek film it was. Wrath of Khan. Wrath of Khan. Let's see. What does that have to do with Michael's personality? A lover of all things sci-fi, especially Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Grew up with the original <laughs> series, and I thought this is probably the closest movie to the original series. It's like, like how that. old are you? I'm 40. <laughs> 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 I'm 
<laughs> but I had two parents that loved Star Trek. <laughs> oh, well, then that makes sense. I'm sorry. You grew up with it. I'm thinking, well, it was released in the 1960s. Mike's going to be 54 in a couple months. <laughs> Not going to be that old. <laughs> so I was going to say, yeah, I guess that, that makes yeah, sense. Even, though, even, though, makes even sense. though Chekhov never met Khan in the original series. <laughs> well, there was there, there is something in IMDb about that. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a patch for that plot hole. <laughs> there, is a, there is a patch. Okay. Uh, where was it at? Uh, Chekhov and Khan recall having met, met each other, although Chekhov was not a bridge officer when Khan came to the Enterprise in Space Seed 1967. It should be remembered that when Khan first took over the Enterprise, he started with the engineering deck. Chekhov was an, was engineering ensign at the time and mounted a resistance against Khan, according to the movie's novelization. Oh, that don't fucking count. <laughs> Surprisingly, was no, that a uh, tape that you put on something to seal it up real quick? Flex seal. Flex seal. That shit. <laughs> Surprisingly, Sulu was also absent from Space Seed, a point no one ever brings up. <laughs> That's because Sulu can, you know. I mean, he's on the bridge right now. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's flex seal shit. Flex seal uh, that shit. Sulu doesn't. It doesn't have a one on one with with Khan the way that Chekhov does though at the beginning of the film. So he does not. Uh, what's your second movie, Mike? Oh, we're not gonna go one 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 one. No, I figured we do all yours and then and then move on to the next person. This way we get a nice round understanding of your uh, personality. Uh, wait, I, I missed that. Play it again, Mike. We are not sure. Roadhouse. <laughs> are we black? Yes, we are. Are we black? Yes, we are. Are we yeah. awake? Is this Malcolm X? No. Blazing Saddles. Oh. Oh, okay. I, I remember the scene now. Yes. I was like, that was. <laughs> it's so hard to figure that one out out of context. Jesus, Hedy, it's Headley, Headley Lamar. That one I would have got in a minute. Yeah, that one I would have got. Yeah, the, the, the are we awake? Are we black? I was like, what the fuck is is that? The jerk? Is that? <laughs> no, that's with poor, the poor black boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's with uh, Gene Wilder's hanging upside down in the jail cell, and he's asking mm-hmm. if he's awake. It depends. Are we black? Yes, we are. <laughs> then we're awake. But we're very confused. <laughs> <laughs> and why, per se, Blazing Saddles? Well, you know, I'm a big Western guy to begin with. Mm-hmm. But it's probably my favorite of all of uh, Mel Brooks' movies. Mm-hmm. I just So with, with it being a Western and it, it being a comedy of Mel Brooks, it's just my style. Okay. Okay. What's uh, your third one, then? My third one. Uh, my name is Inigo Montoya. <laughs> I, I think that's, um, I want to say, is that the Princess Bride? Oh, that's the Princess Bride. Inconceivable! <laughs> yes, the Princess Bride. Uh, can you guess what? That's one of my, that goes with my character. Because mm. you're a big Andre the Giant fan, <laughs> I am a big you like Andre fantasy. Fan. You like fantasy movies, and and I'm a big know. fantasy fan. Yeah, yeah, big fantasy stuff in my life. Yep. Also, it's a classic. <laughs> yeah, oh, it is absolutely it's great. It's a great classic. Uh, so my next movie. It's probably one you probably never heard of. It's called The Undefeated. Undefeated? Mm, no. I have not it's heard not of anything else. else. It is a John Wayne movie. Um, let me bring it up. Does he play a boxer? No. No, 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 no. This happens. So I got it here now. This, this takes place exactly, it starts off taking place three days after Lee surrenders to Grant. 
after the Civil War. Yeah, after the that, about the Civil War, yep. Mm-hmm. And he's a he's a he's a cavalry officer, and he meets a bunch of uh, Confederates trying to get out of there, going to Mexico. Hmm. But I'm a big Civil War buff and John Wayne guy, so it's like puts two things together that I'm that's all all about mm-hmm. me. Cool. And your final one. My final one. You would think by behind me it would be something to do with Star Wars, but it is mm-hmm. not. It is Hoosiers. <laughs> oh, Hoosiers. a movie okay. I have not. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned something about you today, Mike. <laughs> yeah, well, I am. Um, I'm a big sports fan, and I'm a huge college basketball fan. You know, I watched it. I watched the tournament. Almost all the, every year, except for this year, because Carolina wasn't in it. But <laughs> <laughs> so, are you a basketball fan or are you a Carolina? <laughs> uh, I'm a Carolina fan for, first and foremost. But when it comes to college basketball and the tournament, I'll watch any game that's on. Okay. But what about Hoosiers? Then is it just because Hoosiers is like a college basketball movie or it's a college <laughs> basketball movie? Because that tells you something about me with that, and also. I thought that uh, Gene Hackman was good in it, and I thought uh, Dennis Dennis Hopper uh, was Hopper. Yeah, Hopper was excellent in that movie. And Dennis mm-hmm. Hopper was nominated for it for supporting actor. Mm-hmm. This is his only career nomination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like Hoosiers. I haven't seen Hoosiers in a mm-hmm. really long time. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's been, been a while since I watched that one. Either. So let me see if we can put these together. If we can get a, a nice round estimate about who Michael is. So what was your first mm-hmm. one again was uh God! Wrath of Khan. Your second one was Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles. Your third one was Princess Bride. Princess Bride. Your fourth one was, was Undefeated, the Undefeated. Which was an old John Wayne film. And your last one was Hoosiers. Uh Hoosiers. So what I get from this is you're He's a nerd. putting it He's putting it into its crystal ball. He's looking at the tea leaves. I'm an, I'm an athletic nerd. You're an athletic nerd. So you like sports. You like football, porno, and books about war. <laughs> Not really. I missed the porno yeah. part. Yeah, that was the, the uncut, podcast, that's the guys, uncut yeah. version of Hoosiers. Yeah. <laughs> it's, called, it's called Hoosiers. Uh, that was the uncut version of Princess Bride. <laughs> Uh, so I would say, so yeah, so you're a sci-fi fan, you're a fantasy fan, you love, uh, t- uh, uh, Western films, you don't mind a good spoof of a Western film once in a while, and overall, you're also a sports fan, so you're, you're a well-rounded individual, Michael. I try. <laughs> so, uh, Kev, you want right to go, here. or should I go? All right, round. I'll go. I'll go. Mm-hmm. I'll go. I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll go. All right. All right. You know, I don't mind. I'll go. Uh, let me bring up my list. So no, I, have one, no. I have one thing to say in parting, guys, with this. What's that? I have been, and always shall be, your friend. Your friend. Your friend. Best death scene ever. <laughs> yes. Okay. All uh, right. Here we uh, go. There we go. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, gosh, I'm going to have to cut some of these out. All right, here we go. First movie. Mm-hmm. The Muppet Movie, 1979. The Muppet Movie, 1979. Yes. Let me to see. To my best recollection, this was the first movie I've mm-hmm. ever seen. And though I was a tender young age of maybe one, my parents <laughs> said I sat still and silently on their nap, uh, on their lap throughout the entire thing to watch it because I was so enthralled. And uh, the Muppets have been a part of my life ever since. I like that. It's very, like that. very thoughtful, yes. Yeah. Wasn't sure you were going with that at first. I thought maybe you just enjoyed a hand up your ass or something. Well, sometimes, <laughs> you know, depending on how much liquor has been had. <laughs> um, you got to buy me dinner first. Uh, the next thing I'll, I'll pose is uh, it's not a film as much as it was a series. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was Star Trek The Next Generation. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, which mm -hmm. takes place, I think it ran from 87 to 92. It, I think went, seven, it went seven seasons, so it went seven seasons. Probably seven 87 seasons to 94, 94 most likely. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. This was something I uh I got I got into Star Trek late. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um I'm not as old as Mike. And uh <laughs> when I watched it, <laughs> when I watched it, this was actually something my father and I could bond over. He did enjoy he enjoyed the Star Trek movies, and I enjoyed the Star Trek movies. Um, uh, but the Next Generation was was just a phenomenal show. I love the characters. I love the idea of like you know the world, in essence, went to shit, and then it was the age of great enlightenment, and that's how you know. And and it tackled the the really big issues. But above all that, I think it was mostly the bonding with my dad. Mm -hmm. You know how we would watch it together and enjoy it and talk about it. <clears throat> TNG is what like like I had watched the original Star Trek a little bit and I was a bigger fan of the original cast movies than I was the TV series mm -hmm. um, but yes. TNG, TNG is the one that really made me a Star really? Trek fan and then made me want to go back and watch the original series again yeah and it, and it hooked me enough to get me into watching all of the series you know I watched mm -hmm. um Deep Space Nine. After that, almost religiously, I watched Voyager. I uh, I got into Enterprise, you know, um, and even now I'm still watching it with the Picard series, and I'm hoping to see. Um, is it Brave New World? Strange, Strange New Worlds. Strange New Worlds and stuff like that because um, it's looking pretty good. Well, Strange New Worlds happens at the, around the same time as uh, Discovery, so there's some oh, okay. there's some crossover there. Or at least okay. it's brought up in the first episode of uh, Strange New World about something happened with Discovery with them. Okay. And and what I'd say is, like, I can I can watch the J.J. Abrams movies. I just don't hold them as, in as high of a regard as I do what they did with the, you know, the original series, The Next Generation. I, I get the concept uh, that it's a different timeline. Uh, it's a different you're universe. Be upset because that's the that's pretty much what Strange New World is going off with is the J.J. Abrams timeline. Yeah, so is it's Discovery, a, too. So I'll yeah, still I'll give it a go. I'll yeah. still give it a go. I'm just, I mean, you can understand that there, there was the one track, the one timeline, and a different timeline, all based off of the Kelvin. Just like Marvel. You know? Just yeah. like Marvel, exactly. Which kind of leads me to my next movie. <laughs> it's not Marvel, though. Uh, this was the Tim Burton 1989 Batman. 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 Oh, I knew that. I know? knew there was going to be a Batman somewhere. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I love the comics. Uh, I, I enjoyed. I would read the comics a little beforehand, but not like Die Hard. Saw the movie and I was like, "Whoa, this yeah. should be much darker." And that's when, like, like some of the comics coming out, you know. Uh, the Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One and this and that stuff and I was like, oh no, I gotta I gotta move on from like these paper comics to the graphic novels, you know, and start collecting the graphic novels and going actually to a comic book store on Cotman Avenue, um, where they had like their D and D uh, in the back uh, or not D and D? Oh, is it Worlds of Warcraft? Was there one that's that was? That's, that's another that's thing, right? Okay. Um, but I would go in and talk to the guy and he'd tell me what's coming out. And that branched me out into going from Batman to the Flash to X-Men, you know, and that just kind of branched me out into the comics and I really got into it. And that's not to say I didn't appreciate Christopher Reeves as Superman. You know, that <laughs> I mean, that was, I really liked that. And I, I watch it now and it, it, it's, as, it's as campy okay. as the 1960s Batman could be. You know, but for some reason, Christopher Reeves as Superman is just it for me. You know, no. I, like I, thought you were, I thought you were, I thought you were a big Brandon Root fan. Oh yes, <laughs> I, I absolutely was. He did the best he could with what he what what he was given. Which I think the much. actor himself was <laughs> pretty good, but um, yeah. So, what's your uh, fourth one? My fourth one is um is the Marx Brothers movies. <laughs> Anything Marx Brothers, because you have the slapstick, but you also have the wit, you know, you have the the sarcasm the sarcasm of Groucho, you have the slapstick of Harpo, 
and you have like the uh, the quick rapport or, or you know retort coming from uh, Chico, you know. And I just love their movies. Like it could be Duck Soup, it could be A Night at the Opera, it could be Horse Feathers. I love them all. You know, they're all really good. I remember we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, I need to watch it again. So I went on, and the only one I could find on like any of the streaming networks was Duck Soup. Duck Soup. Uh, so I watched it. I mean, I liked them all too, but that's the only one I was able to find without having to go, you know, through other means to find them. <laughs> I think my brother might. We might have gotten my brother a you know, VHS collection way, way back, and he had Ooh. like four, you know, but um, they were also really good. And the last one may be of a bit of a surprise to you guys. Uh, it's called About Time. Is that the one with uh, Donald Gleason and yes. and, and Rachel and, uh, McAdams and Bill Nye? And, uh, Bill yeah. Nye. and it's, it's a time travel movie, but it's not a sci-fi time travel movie. Mm-hmm. And um, I like it on so many levels. I like it because it's funny. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got quirkiness. I like it because it looks at um, how... You, you you can want to have changed something in your past, but you have to understand that that change would have had ripples, repercussions, you know? Um, I like that it makes you appreciate the moment that you're in, you know, the whole thing where at a certain point, and I'm, I know I'm spoiling it, but it's been well over a decade since it came out, <laughs> you know? It's like at some point, even though this was a genetic thing, it was passed down from father to son, um, you can't outrun death, you know, and death is still a part of your life, even if you can time travel and stuff like that. Um, and like how he learned to appreciate his time with his father, he, he would go back once he fe- realized his dad was I, um, the times that he could go back, he wanted to go back to the moments that really mattered to him, you know, the walks on the beach and the playing around in the back and the, the time at the park and stuff like that. And I was just like, wow. You know, so that's my five. No, that's a great one. I like about times a great movie. Isn't it like it on his 21st birthday or something? He finds out he can mm-hmm. travel through time. Yeah. And, and it's then, a conversation uh, between him and his dad. And it's like, you're so full of shit. And his dad's like, I'm not full of shit, but you know, and then they go through it and he's like, wow. And he's like blown away by it. And he's, he used at first he uses it to get Rachel McAdams to fall in love with him mm-hmm. and then starts, you know, learning that there's, other ways to use it that are better than that and that are, you know, and plus it's hard not to fall in love with Rachel McAdams too. It is, it is. <laughs> but you also see like he, his sisters had trouble with relationships and that's had repercussions and he's tried to fix that by going into the past. And sometimes it kind of skewer, you know, it veers things off course and he has to learn to live with what he went back to do, mm-hmm. you know? So no, it's, a, it's a really good movie. It's an it's a, a interesting one. Mm-hmm. So uh, looking at yours here, Muppet seventy nine, mm-hmm. CNG, Batman mm-hmm. eighty nine, Marx Brothers films, and About Time. Mm-hmm. Uh, this tells me that you have multiple personality no. disorders. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. That settles it. I think there's one thing we can say about all of our lists is that we're all fucking nerds. Mm-hmm. Nerd. <laughs> So I had so many that I wanted to put on here. There's just so many movies that mean something to me. But I really no, tried. About you? Well, I really tried not to pick movies that were my favorites. Right. I tried to pick movies that had some sort of sentimental value to me for some reason or another. So the first one I put on my list is Jedi. Return of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. 1983. Uh, do you want to guess why? Because it's the first Star Wars you saw in theaters. It's the first movie I remember going to the theater to see. Mm. I know that my parents took me to see Popeye when that came out, but I was too young to kind of really remember it that well. Mm -hmm. I was seven when Jedi came out, so it's one of my first like vivid memories of going to the movies. And at that point, I had only seen I only seen the original Star Wars. I had never seen Empire yet, and so like I saw Jedi in the theater, and it was like blew me away like oh my god star wars is so fucking amazing mm-hmm. and and it stayed with me my whole life man i'm a star wars fan till today because of that experience i had in the theater uh number two 
Oh, no, we're not going to talk about how you shit on the Ewoks. I know I shouldn't. <laughs> Jedi's not my favorite of the Star Wars films, but it's a, it's a great it's memory. The sentimentality of the, the sentimentality of the memory. Uh, the second one on my list is the creature from the Black Lagoon. One of the old mm, Universal really? Monster films. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Of all the monster movies, it's probably one of the least appreciated. I know. It really is, yes. So, my dad's favorite films, some of his favorite films were the old Universal Monster films. And right. I remember, like, growing up, he would always, like, introduce me to the films that he liked because he wanted me to appreciate them, too. So, like, mm-hmm. he showed me West Side Story because that's one of his favorite films. And he showed me Guys and Dolls because that's one of his favorite films. And then he showed me Dracula and Frankenstein and all that, and the Wolfman, and all the Universal Monster films. But for some reason, the creature from the Black Ragoon was the one that stuck with me. It was mm-hmm. the one that I actually was, like, the most entertained by for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but it's kind of like, it's it's the one that stuck with me. And, and because it's something that my dad introduced me to, it was, like, you know, one of my, my early... Experience, experiences with movies that made me fall in love with them. I get that. Yeah, I can understand yeah. that. My third it one. Also, also to play, you know, in the pool, play a lot yeah. of fun being the you know, monster. Being the a monster. Mm-hmm. My third one is House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie that made me realize I could actually hate a movie. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's a lie. It's not House of a Thousand Corpses. It is Jurassic Park. Hmm. Hmm. Jurassic Park, I saw one of the first movies I've ever I ever saw by myself at the theater. Like and when I mean by myself, I mean like not with my parents. Like I went with my friends to the theater to see it. This was hmm. in the nineties. I was in high school at the time, so I was like allowed to do a little bit more than I was as a kid. And uh I remember going to the theater and the first time the Brontosaurus is on screen and you see it hop up on its hind legs to get the the leaves out of the tree. I remember sitting there going, holy fuck, you can do this in a movie. Mm -hmm. And despite it being CGI, there was enough like practical effects in there too, for me not to be too angry with it. Mm -hmm. But it was one of my first experiences of going to the movies and saying, wow, this is what a movie can do. And even though I have, all these movies from the 80s that I loved and that I had seen a million times. That's the first like movie I remember going to the theater and just be totally blown away by it because I was old enough to appreciate what I was seeing. It was a whole new level of movie making at that point. I mean, yeah. it was it shortly after that that Lucas was like, fuck this, I'm redoing them, you know? Yeah. He went back to his original trilogy and was like, I had, the vision I had can now come to life, you know? And it's funny because yeah. um, talk I talk to some of the kids now who watch the original 77 Star Wars or anything else, and they're like, why was it like that? You know, why was it? I said, because, man, they didn't have the tech at the time. They couldn't, they couldn't pull it off. And then they could. You know, it was the turning point. And it's not shocking that Jurassic Park is a Spielberg film. Because if somebody's going to yeah. do it right, it's Spielberg, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was funny, like, I, I watched Alien the other night uh, for the first time in a while. I watched the original Alien. I haven't seen it in a while. Oh, God. All practical effects. Yeah. yeah. Fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Still really, Scott up. took full advantage of, like, dark corners and, and you know, um, light flares and shit like that to really and, – and the music to really put that fear into people. The scene where they land on the planet and the space jockey, they see the space jockey thing for the first time. Mm-hmm. The people in that scene are his kids. He had his oh, really? kids wearing astronaut costumes that look like the actors' ones, so that it, the perspective made it look like it was these these adults standing in front of this giant thing. Oh, wow. It was actually a bunch of kids. So, yeah, I love that kind of stuff, man. And so when I saw Jurassic Park for the first time in 93, I was like, wow, a movie can do this. It can be mm-hmm. all these different things and really stick with me yeah the fourth one i think says a lot about me. <laughs> john carpenter's they live <laughs> um, the true bubble gum and kick ass and i'm all out of bubble gum <laughs> with all respect to wayne What's and the matter, kick ass 2.0 <laughs> i love me some john carpenter 
You do? But I mainly picked this because of, you know, that. You love yourself. You love yourself. Uh, Rowdy Piper too. I love yeah. Rowdy Piper too, but it's mainly that that charming trait I have of really loving bad movies. That's true. <laughs> I, I have a, a a sentimental soft spot for really bad movies, but bad movies they're actually good movies. Bad movies like, that are actually good movies. Big Trouble in Little China. Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah. They live. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, almost anything that John Carpenter made. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh my god, there's so many that I can name. <laughs> a lot of stuff with Kurt Russell too. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I'm drawing a blank right now because there's so many in my in my artillery. House of a Thousand Corpses is not one of them. But, uh, <laughs> bad movies anyway. that were bad movies. And then just like you guys, my last one is a curveball pick. Mm-hmm. My last one is The Music Man. Oh, oh. Hmm. The Music Al Man. Jones? What's that? That's oh, you're thinking, of, you're thinking of the jazz singer. Oh, okay. Uh, Music Man came out in 1962, stars Robert Preston, uh, underrated actor, in my opinion. Uh, is this Shirley the sequel Jones, to the Buddy jazz Hackett. singer? What's that? Is this the sequel to the jazz singer? Mm-mm. Oh. If okay. you've never seen the Music Man, check it out. It's a really fun musical. Uh, it takes place in like the early 1900s in a little town in Iowa. Uh, Robert Preston plays a con man named Harold Hill who comes to town claiming that he is a conductor and is going to build a boys orchestra in the town. Uh, and basically it's a way for him to con people out of money by having to buy instruments and uniforms and all this other stuff and claiming that he can teach them how to play these instruments. <laughs> and he's, he's trying to get out of town because of the con act, but then he ends up falling in love with the town librarian and, uh, you know, hilarity ensues as, as people are known to do. There's people are known it's to be always the town librarian. It's actually why they closed down many of the libraries. They were becoming <laughs> brothels. Yeah, too many people you just know. wanted to bang those naughty librarians. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, some some buns and uh, and uh, horn rim glasses, man. My wife, my wife's gonna hate me for saying this, but she texted me a picture of her at work the other day because she had to get dressed up for some meeting or something. And, mm-hmm. and she's like, "What do you think?" And I was like, "You look like a naughty librarian." <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> she's like seriously and i'm like yeah but you're my naughty library <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so the music man is a musical from the 60s it's one of the earliest like movies like musicals that i remember being like uh exposed to as a kid mm-hmm. um but the thing that i really love about it is uh when i was in high school i did some plays and uh, the first play i ever did was the music man and I had gotten a lead in the play, even though it was like mm-hmm. one of the first ones I ever did. And so it went from being a, a movie that I really, really enjoyed to something I got to perform in myself. Mm-hmm. And so it was a nice little, you know, and, and that's, you know, me, I'm a, I'm a ham. I like getting out there and performing and singing and, thing and doing things like that. So it's just kind of part of who I am as a uh, outgoing Do performer I'm kind of guy. Yeah, little did they know it would lead to Fiddler on the Roof. I wasn't Fiddler on the Roof. I know you were. That's why I said little did I did they know it would lead to Fiddler on the Roof. I was in Fiddler on the Roof, and then uh, I did a little bit of Hamlet in college. So I like I had some fun doing that stuff. Yeah. So then those are mine. Less so. known sequel, Fiddler in the Cellar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bassoonist on the Train. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. And now he's a podcaster. In a in the man cave. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Podcaster in a panel room. All right. So uh, my wife gave me her five. So I'm going to throw those out here real quick. Now, are these Katie's five on you or are these Katie's five on Katie? Katie's five on Katie. Okay. So my wife's first two picks are both because she relates to the main female character in the film. It's 10 Things I Hate About You okay. and When Harry Met Sally. So okay. She says that there's a little bit of her personality in both of those characters. Cynical. <laughs> she's a little, little cynical, like Cat in, in Ten Things I Hate About You. Mm-hmm. But then she's also kind of like silly, like Sally is and Harry Met Sally. Mm-hmm. She's a little on the shy side sometimes, but she can also be, you know, Princess Never Happy once in a while. 
She's also very Once particular when she places an order at a restaurant. Yes, oh, she does do the <laughs> Sally at the restaurant. She really does. I tell her that all the time. You're 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 the Sally when you order at the restaurant. Uh, the third movie is The Rescuers, uh, because okay. it was the first movie that she ever went to see that her dad took her to. Nice. Yeah, and nice. so you know she's always she was always very close to her dad. So that's that's something mm-hmm. that just stays with her. The fourth one. Uh. It is the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Wow. Boy, now did that, that take a left turn. Yeah. She, well, she <laughs> loved Rocky Horror. Her favorite. She loved her Rocky favorite. Horror. She used to go to the midnight shows all the time. She had a, a mm-hmm. group of friends that she used to hang out in college who used to do the Rocky Horror Show performances at this like bar near where she lives. So we used to go see that oh. all the time. Um, and she said it's the first movie that my mother-in-law took her to see. Wow. And I found that very odd because my Me mother too. can't sit still for 30 <laughs> minutes, let alone a two hour movie. Well, you well, see, Sue, that's like that uh, movie. Her, her mother in law went, my aunt went so that she could clean up the mess from the people doing all the things in the movie. That's <laughs> probably, probably what my mother loved it. That's probably what she was doing. Yeah, clean it up. Doing. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> and then her last film she chose was Steel Magnolias. Oh, that was one my mother loved. I yeah. was thinking about putting that on. It was something I don't particularly <sighs> care for the movie, though it's done really well. The acting, the acting is really good. It's an all-star cast by today's you know standards, even though some of them were like still fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, Julia Roberts, but man, if I if I see that movie, it's my mom. It's just mm-hmm. I'm thinking of my mom at that time. Katie says she chose it because it's one of the first movies she remembers seeing that made her feel like a million different emotions at the same time. Because mm-hmm. it's like you're you're laughing at the beginning because of the relationship these characters have, and then mm-hmm. you're happy when she gets married, has the kid, and then like she dies at the end, and it's super sad, and then it's like mm-hmm. all these different emotions that hit her. She said while watching it, but Do you that feel is, the that anger is a, from that is, Sally Field and. That is a powerhouse performance by Sally Field yeah, in that movie. <laughs> yeah, you feel the anger at, from Sally Field. I mean, each of the characters expresses like it could be a different emotion. Yeah. You know, Sally Field being conservative and concerned, uh, Julia Roberts being free, like you know, restricted but still ha- feeling free and, and positive. Um, Dolly Parton's character in Olympia Dukakis. Dukak? Yeah, it's Olympia Dukakis. And then you had uh, Daryl Hannah playing the real nerdy character. Daryl Hannah and uh, all fight for her. Warren I love, baby sister. I like this, I uh, this scene at the end when uh, uh, Sally Field blows up on Shirley McLean. Shirley McLean. <laughs> that's the one I couldn't think of. Yeah. And so Olivia Dukakis comes up and goes, just punch her. Just hit her. We'll sell <laughs> t-shirts, you know? And And it was great. A good movie, and it's mm-hmm. and I, I look at this list and I'm like, yeah, that's my wife. It, it sounds a lot like yeah. my wife, you know. And, yeah. and and it was funny because I said, what five movies say something about your personality? And she was like, hmm, ten things I hate about you, Harry Met Sally, but and she like rolled them right off. Wow. And then it, it took me like from the day I told you guys about this till this morning to finish my five. <laughs> and I'm still not sure if I'm happy with it or if there's other ones I could have chosen. I was still adding at dinner tonight. I was like, well, <laughs> I should put this on. And I knew I wanted, like, about time I wanted to put on there. But I'm like, does this say something about me? But it, it's such a difference from the other movies that I had put on there, mm-hmm. you know? Um, because I do, I do enjoy a good drama or sentimental movie. Um, I can watch something and really feel for the characters, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of times when I'm watching a movie that deals with father-son relationships, mother-son relationships, just family relationships, that I get caught up. I, I get the feels. I get all choked up. I get the feels, you and know. I thought of, like, like I could have put, like, Stand By Me on there because it was, like, a, a movie about growing up that I was always, like, really fond of or the Goonies mm-hmm. or something like that. But I was trying, like I said, to stay away from movies that I consider like my favorites. Mm. Uh, and do, here's something we could probably do down the line. This would probably be a challenging one too. Uh, our list of our top 25 films of all time. Mm. Like if we had to do our own AFI list, like our own personal AFI list, what would that be? That'd be fucking hard. <laughs> yeah, that would be tough. That'd be really tough, be tough to try tough. to narrow it down. Or, to yeah, films. And you have to rank them. Yeah. <laughs> or you could do. Five movies, each movie representing a family member, 
you know, mm-hmm. something about that movie that represents somebody in your family that you know, your wife, your father, your mother. I would know. say for my wife, I would definitely go with the Harry Met Sally thing because of her, her way that she orders. Uh, my mm-hmm. dad would be West Side Story because I know it's his all-time favorite movie. My mom would be RoboCop because she feels so bad for that man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> I made my mom watch RoboCop with oh, me. Man. And at the end of the film, I was like, Mom, what do you think? And she was like, I feel so bad for that man. <laughs> Look at what man. they did to him. His family couldn't even see him. And <laughs> she was like, so she felt awful. <laughs> so, Poor Mrs. It sounds like your mother. <laughs> it sounds like your mother. Yeah, it's like my mom. Uh, Mike, you have any beer trivia or history for us today? I do. I have some beer trivia for you boys. Roggen beer is a German style ale made with rye that is typically made up of at least 50% malt rye and carries the grain characteristics spice, spicy and bready flavor. There you go, boys. All right. How are our drinks this evening? Kevin, Kevin how was your walk down watery beer oh. lane? They're gone. They're good. <laughs> I, you know, I'll still do a lager. I, I mean, I don't mind if I'm uh, I'm at a party, lagers around, and I'm good with it. I'm I'm still okay. I can still, you know, make a little ultra and kind of weaning away from. But God knows, I could lose the weight again. So maybe that's something <laughs> in my future. Um, but I'm liking my golden monkey, and I think by the end of this bottle, I will be uh, quite ready for the night. <laughs> Mike, what did you do again? I drank the Upward Brewing Company from Catskill Mountains, New York Base Camp, the lager beer from my good buddy Kevin. I also had a Kev beer, the Sap House from West Kill Brewing. It's the only beer I drank this evening because it was pretty thick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I wasn't sure if I could get another one down after I finished that one because it, uh, it was a little heavy. Heavier towards the end, and it, I felt like it was at the beginning. I didn't think it was that bad at the beginning, but then as I was getting to the bottom of the can here, I was like, no, this is this is definitely a... Oh, just shake it up next time. Balance beer. it out. Just shake, shake it up. I've only had the one beer tonight, <laughs> but do you guys know how the week before you go on vacation is like the longest week of the year? <laughs> I'm feeling dead tired, and it's not even Friday yet. <laughs> mm. I hear you. So, everybody, thank you for joining us tonight for episode uh, 102. This was our, um, or I'm sorry, episode 103, rather. This was our season finale for season five. Uh, we hope you enjoyed listening to the podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it for you. Uh, don't forget to drop us an email, filmsfermentation at gmail.com, or visit linktree.com slash filmsfermentation for all of our social media podcast links. Feel free to send us a message about what five films you would show if you want somebody to know about your personality. I'd love to hear it. And we can always give you a shout out on the next episode. Uh, we are going to take a little break. Uh, Mike is going away for a little bit. So we are ending our season, going to take a short break, and then we'll be coming back to you in May. Uh, so don't forget to stop by the Crossroads Between Pickled and Fermented on May 8th. Uh, Monday, May 8th, we will be dropping our season six premiere, episode 104. We're going to be recording it on May 4th, which is Star Wars Day, so our season premiere is going to be about the future of Star Wars. There are a lot of announcements made recently. Uh, Mandalorian just finished. Uh, we have. Uh, oh, so good. How do you like, you you like the season finale? I did not get oh, to watch it. Oh, so good. Adrian got home so freaking late. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it was very good. So, yeah, so what are you talking I was, about? I was pissed. Well, we can talk about that on our uh, season six premiere, dropping again on May 8th, episode 104 The Future of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And don't forget that we also have some other uh, cool things coming up this season. I'll probably be dropping a mini pod in the next week or so, uh, counting out some like uh, upcoming episodes that we have in season six of Films and Fermentation. In the meantime, I'm Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. Thanks again for joining us, folks. Cheers. 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 Yep, 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 yep.
Good evening, gentlemen. Hello, Good sir. Evening. Good evening. Say hi, Kate. Hi, Kate. <laughs> gentlemen, I'm in need of a man cave. <laughs> Using my wife's office every week is harsh. Well, it's harsh. Kevin said he's in need of a man cave. There's two of you in that house. How many yes. rooms are in that house? A plenty. A plenty. So pick one. I, I call it the you. basement was uh <laughs> that is, that is technically the cave. I just need to finish it off. Well, I need to start it. Then I need to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a, a something to do that, uh, during the summer on a weekend, the three of us should get together and take care of it. <laughs> That sounds good to me, especially with plenty of alcohol. That'll make our measurements even. I think you should claim the pool as your man cave. I like that idea too. <laughs> yeah, but you know, water and electronics don't mix. <laughs> One more day, gentlemen, and I'm on vacation. Nice. I forgot to ask you where you're going. Well, we're going to Atlanta. Right Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. Oh, gonna go He's to going to Atlanta. Wilmington, Delaware. No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that uh, scene in Wayne's World? You could go to Hawaii. You could go to, uh, you know, Delaware. <laughs> Delaware. I mean, we're Delaware. in Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that later. Yep. I'm definitely drinking a Kevin beer tonight. I didn't confuse it with a Mike beer this time. <laughs> yeah. Is it, it one Mike of the recently. ones I gave you, or is it one of the ones that I would like? It's uh, the Sap House. Okay. Yeah. I actually don't think I tried that one. Well, it's, that was it's one, one of the Catskill Mountains ones. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I like the upward ones. I had definitely gotten. You know, like I had gone up to get them. Um, or tr tried them, but that was one. It was like, oh, they're in the area. We should definitely get it, but I didn't think I tried it yet. This is West Kill Brewing. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You know, Maybe I just wonder what you got from Beer World, probably. Cool. Yes. That's definitely one sometimes you, from Beer sometimes World. you don't get to try the beer. You're just like, that looks cool. Let's grab it. That's right. Well, it sounds and like one you would like, Kev, because it's a maple brown ale. So. Yes, yes, yes. I had my dad try. Oh, I haven't had you guys try it yet. Uh, the the cream liqueur that we purchased from up there that tastes like uh, like almost like um, eggnog because mm -hmm. it's got cinnamon and maple and everything else in it. He liked it. Everyone who's tried it has liked it. So when you guys come over, we have two bottles. I don't think we're going through it anytime soon. <laughs> Did you, try, you guys the, have to try it? The the gin that was aged the bourbon, gin, bourbon gin. No, we haven't tried that yet. No, wait. Well, I've tried that. I had that at the distillery. It was very good. I had a little taster of it, mm. but we haven't cracked open the bottle yet. Mm. And I, when I was at, um, I was going to say Better Homes and Gardens, but it's fine wine and good spirits. <laughs> uh, actually, it's <laughs> it's uh, uh, or that you know, the one that's over here. I forget what it's called. Um, no, it's, I picked it's up wine and spirits. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I picked up two new, two other Southern tier ones because of mm. how great the one Mike had was. It's a French toast. Is one is a French toast, one's a vanilla scoop, and then I got a can of something that is a cookies and cream. So, that's... get all my pastry beers. And you pour them right on your ice cream. That's right. Oh. <laughs> what I'm scared of is cookies and cream. Is normally taste like Oreos. I don't know if I want to drink an Oreo beer. I don't know. You dunk, you dunk I Oreos. Well, I don't know if you dunk, but people dunk Oreos in milk all the time. I would drink that. Yeah, Oreos in milk, but I don't know. It's Oreos beer. In beer. <laughs> I don't know. I, I got three beers that kind of <clears throat> talk about me growing up. Okay. The first beer I had when I was five. The next beer <laughs> I had. <laughs> if I had to talk about the beers I had when I was growing up, I have to go out and find some. Uh, Perhaps blue I, ribbon. Well, then well, I, I was I looking for to... Rolling Rock. I couldn't <laughs> find a single of Rolling Rock around. If we're talking about stuff we had growing up, then I'd have to talk about the whiskey they put on my lips when my teeth were coming out. <laughs> I have to talk about some uh, uh, Picardi. <laughs> I was a big Killian's Red guy. 
okay. when I was younger. That was like a go-to. And then and then I discovered Zima. And then you discovered Zima. <laughs> you had to put the Jolly Rancher in the bottom of the Zima. No, nah, I just straight. I just like my Zima straight. <laughs> Zima on like the rocks. Malt liquor. <laughs> Colt 45. Colt 45. Yeah, that's what we drank when we played Edward 40 hands. 